And um, next, I just want to invite Paula Paris, uh, who's involved with the Cambridge Black History Project, um, to give a quick summary of Cambridge Black History resources. Paula. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Oh, Cambridge has been home to one of this country's oldest Black communities dating back to the early 1600s. So aside from images of slavery, brutality, inequality, and victimhood, the collective significance of the individuals and communities of color in Cambridge has largely been overlooked until recently. Uh, many research projects and family archives contain evidence of rich and vibrant African-American and Afro-Caribbean communities with respect to culture, business enterprise, home ownership, and social and political activism. Oh, you spotlighted me and now I can't see it. Okay, thank you. Um, there, there are a myriad of projects around the city, which um, we have discovered, um, that have been exploring and documenting various aspects of Black history. Some focusing on different historical periods like Black uh, re, uh, Reconstruction, uh, some topical like Cambridge slaveholder families, abolitionist movement, female abolitionists, uh, some focus on specific individuals, some focus on specific neighborhoods like Cambridgeport or Louisville, uh, some institutions like churches, social clubs, and community centers, as well as houses, monuments, and structures. Many overlap and are complementary. So Kathy sent, out, sent around a list of um, resources and research that is, are available, and it's by no means exhaustive, but it's a good place to start um, for those of you who uh, our topic in our, our, our breakout group was, you know, filling in uh, a more complete version of, of history. So the unifying theme uh, in all of these resources is to produce a more complete picture of this area's history and one of which everyone can be proud. Those who cannot learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So goes a popular adaptation of George Santayana's, of a George Santayana quote. Our distinguished guests will present not just facts, but some lessons that we can carry forward to take advantage of this critical moment in history to envision and help build a better future. Over to you, Kathy. Let's go. Thank you, Thank you Paula. Um, I wanna just give a fuller introduction to our guests. Um, Dr. Carrie Greenwich is the author of Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. Listed by the New York Times as one of the top picks of 2019, the book is the first biography of the Boston editor, um, uh, written in nearly 50 years. She and Dr. Crispin Japra are professors of history at Tufts University in the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora. Chris's latest book, Black Ghost of Empire will be published by Simon and Schuster this coming spring. Chris is the director of Black History and Action for Cambridgeport, and Carrie is the co-director of the African American Trail Project. Thank you both for speaking with us tonight. Um, we're thrilled to have you here. Thanks so much. Uh, it's wonderful to be with you all. Uh, I'm I'm Chris, and uh, I have the honor of introducing Carrie in a moment. Carrie and I are colleagues in the same department and um, I, I you know, really do feel so grateful on a daily basis to have colleagues as brilliant as Carrie Greenwich. And um, I'm so happy we're gonna hear from her and learn from her uh, in a few minutes. As I, I was teaching today and uh, I teach an undergraduate intro class um, and uh, I always open my classes with the song and Today I opened with Redemption Song by uh, Marley. And the last lines of the song kind of occur to me um, now as we're meeting also in this august company when Bob Marley says, come let us sing songs of freedom together. And I love that, um, that invocation that we should share our voices and sing about freedom um, because it, it suggests that we all have you know, a different voice to add to that chorus and the chorus is the point. Um, and 
and I, you know, I want to say a little bit about the, the, the freedom songs that have been sung from 137 Alston Street, um, which is the center for the Black History in Action, um, the Black History of Cambridge, Black History in Action for Cambridgeport mm -hmm. Back um, project, which is centered at St. Augustine's African Orthodox Church, um, and which is really a manifestation of voices coming together to sing about freedom past, freedom present, and freedoms to come. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll, I'll reserve talking in more detail about um, the project of BAC, of which Carrie Greenwich is on the board. Um, the esteemed and wonderful and talented Kathy Zussi is uh, a very important leader of the group and our treasurer. And uh, Maggie McNally is uh, another wonderful, inspiring, um, again, volunteer leader. So people really working from the heart um, to join their voices to make this project work. And of course, the community at St. Augustine's, including the Eccles brothers um, and uh, Sister Eloive and Antonio and others who form the vestry of the church. Um, so just a word about Black History in Action for Cambridge Port. We um, came together as a community. Many of you, uh, we've actually already, you know, been in touch with you to, to, to help us, um, have raised money uh, to help restore the exterior of the church. We were very successful to obtain, um, in our first pass, a $110,000 grant from the Massachusetts Cultural Council, which gets us a good portion of the way, but not all of the way to where we want to be. And fortunately, the community is stepping up. We've had a really successful 100th birthday party uh, a couple of weeks ago um, in which um, we had three mayor, one present mayor, uh, Sambul, and two previous mayors who came to help sing Freedom um, and the Songs of Freedom at St. Augustine's. Uh, and that's been wonderful to see how the community is stepping up to help us secure the church, secure the property from gentrification, um, but also to reimagine once we have that beautiful red shingling, what's gonna happen to the inner life of the church. And so that Paula is here, that Kenneth is here, real, you know, I would say titans and, and, and heroes of um, black history and, um, uh, uh, and, and creativity in Cambridge over many decades. Uh, and others, you know, we've been so grateful for what you've done to, to help us and to teach us, and we're looking forward to what's coming in the future. So let me end my piece about Black History in Action with that, because I do want to pass it over um, to Professor Greenwich to, to, to carry, um, to tell us a little bit about um, uh, the wonderful book that I love coming back to and, and, and reading portions of um, because of how beautifully it's written and what it illuminates about Black history, about Cambridge, about Boston, and about what freedom means past, present, and future. So with that um, brief intro, probably a little longer than, than, than necessary, let me turn it over to you, Carrie. And then once you're done, we can have a little time for Q&A, and then we'll open it up to a full Q&A at about 6.45. Sounds good. And I'm, I'm, is, can everybody hear me? Yes. I, I, I just wanted to say right back at you, Chris. I'm, I'm very well, I'm very lucky to work in a department where Chris is the head of the department and I have to deal with very little um, drama in academia um, uh, within our department because of Chris's leadership and his passion and his scholarship in terms of transnational blackness and, and intellectual history. So thank you so much, Chris. And I'm gonna start by just doing a brief kind of putting the book into context because I think the genesis of Trotter and Black Boston during the time period that I'm um, most familiar with is germane to the history of Cambridge and African-American and African diasporic history in Cambridge. So I'm going to do a, a brief um, talk. Um, I have some slides. Um, and then at the end, I'll open up for questions, but it will also be a moment for people to ask more about the fabulous church, St. Augustine's Church in Cambridge. Um, as I'll talk about in my, in my talk, my family, um, my father's side of the family came to Cambridge from Barbados in the 1920s and I grew up um, with in that neighborhood during the 1970s and 1980s, which very differently. Um, my great great aunt just sold her house in um, Cambridgeport 
after years from developers pressuring her. That was about a year and a half ago. Um, and so that that house on Green Street has been completely redone and is now condo. So I'm very familiar with the area and from the area and then with my scholarship. So um, let's bring up the slides. Forget who was helping me with the slides. Oh, thank you. All right. Begin with a quote by uh, Michel Rof Trio. We are never as steeped in history as when we pretend not to be. Um, next slide. When Martin Luther King Jr. spoke about Boston, he called the city his second home, and he referred to Cambridge as, quote, that other city across the river where many good things come. This may seem like a contradiction given Boston's reputation as either, quote, the most racist city in America, according to Bill Russell, or the most racially liberal place, according to John F. Kennedy. Massachusetts might have elected the first black members of the state legislature, the first black popularly elected senator, and the first black governor since Reconstruction, but Boston is still known as a place where the median wealth of its black citizens is $8, while the median wealth of a white citizen is $265,000. Similarly, Cambridge is a city that has long been known for its liberalism, but it is a city where residency in the city of Cambridge, in order to form a two bedroom apartment anywhere in the city, one has to make at least $110,000 um, as a, uh, as, as a uh, married couple. By the time Martin Luther King Jr. graduated from Boston University School of Theology in 1955, his sentiments about the city, Boston, and Cambridge and their defining role in his own life, much like the history of Black Boston generally, are notable for their complexity. A man who remembered Boston fondly as the city where he met his future wife and called Cambridge a place where, quote, I could really feel down home with the people, end quote. He learned about Gandhi's nonviolent principles from the country's first Black dean at a predominantly white college, Howard Thurman. King also remembered Boston as a place where, quote, apathy and white liberal complacency, end quote, were as powerful as Southern manifestos and Confederate flags. Next slide. <laughs> as a child growing up in a suburb outside of Boston during the 1980s, my experience of the city, particularly Cambridge and Boston and the wider New England region of which it is a part, was shaped by the racial and cultural complexity that King described. My father's family, as I said before, traveled frequently between Barbados and our home, family home in Cambridge. And they always made me believe that blackness in Boston and in Cambridge was Bayesian and Jamaican, as well as Cape Verdean and Southern, that black people spoke Portuguese and Haitian Creole and Spanish, as well as French Creole and um, English. My mother's father, who you see here, was a World War II veteran from Virginia. He also made me believe that Massachusetts, New England, and particularly Cambridge were black spaces where people from across the diaspora, as well as native people in Mashby, Plymouth, and Gayhead were central to stories of Bunker Hill, the first Thanksgiving, and the founding of Harvard College. Samuel Lee Dance was a proud black veteran of World War II. He was raised in Petersburg, Virginia, and he was intensely political despite the fact that he lacked a high school education. He and my grandmother were activists in the mold of Howard Thurman, whose Jesus and the Disinherited sat on our bookshelf beside a copy of The Souls of Black Folk. My grandparents were amongst the first African Americans to sell their house in Cambridge and purchase a home in Arlington during the 1950s, although they spent their lives involved in civil rights work around Greater Boston and New England. It was from them that I learned to look for Black stories beyond the existing scholarship in supposedly predominantly white places like New England and Boston, and supposedly liberal places like Cambridge, as well as distinctly African places like the Mississippi Delta and Haiti. In his silver Cadillac, piled with me, my sisters, and various neighborhood kids who happened to be around, Grandpa would take long drives up Route 2 or west on the Massachusetts per Turnpike. He would often drive around the area that is now known as the port, but we never called it that back in the 80s. Grandpa would take long drives uh, through the city of Boston and Cambridge and then make his way into the country on Route 2. As we drove, he would show us the places where black people left their footprints, even if most people missed their trail. The area around Walden Pond where black people lived before Henry David Thoreau, the area around um, Central Square 
where uh, St. Augustine's Church was founded and where many of my paternal relatives still worshiped, the shores of Salem Willows and Plum Island where black people of his age attended church picnics and family reunions. And all of these places in Ayer, Fishburg, Cambridge, uh, Alston, Brighton, New Bedford, where black people had lived long before strip malls and parking lots erased their existence. My grandfather was the first person to tell me about William Monroe Trotter, the subject of my most recent book, and the person I'm just gonna talk about a little bit today so that we can put the black history of Cambridge and Boston into a proper context. Um, so next slide. In August, 1902, William Monroe Trotter led a group of black lawyers, ministers and community leaders to the Massachusetts State House. This was after hosting a meeting at St. Paul's AME Church um, in which he urged people to agitate, agitate, agitate for their rights. The group that he brought to the state house was there to protest the recent arrest and upcoming extradition of a North Carolina field hand named Monroe Rogers. Trotter and his group wanted Governor Winthrop Murray Crane to prevent Rogers return to North Carolina for arson. One year earlier in 1901, two black boys ages 14 and 17 were brutally lynched in Greensboro while sitting in jail on vagrancy charges. It was no wonder then that Rogers fled his home outside of Charlotte for his mother's house in Massachusetts after confronting his landlord over unpaid wages. The white man's barn mysteriously burned down days after the confrontation, and there was no guarantee that the 22-year-old black man who you've seen here on the, um, um, on the bottom right, um, that he would receive a fair trial. He was arrested as he fled between Cambridge and his uh, parents' home in Brockton. Um, he was looking for jobs in Cambridge at the time. As he was arrested, um, he was put into jail and Trotter mobilized grassroots protests that prompted the meeting between African-Americans in Boston, Cambridge, some as far as Woburn, Lexington, and Arlington to meet with the governor. The group's central argument was that failure by North Carolina to enforce the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment as evidence in the state's unwillingness to investigate or prosecute a recent lynching, prevented Rogers from receiving a fair trial. Let Massachusetts remember her history, the Guardian proclaimed the newspaper, and protect those who seek refuge from Southern barbarism. In proclaiming the radical roots of antebellum abolition as justification for 20th century demands for Monroe Rogers, Trotter shows the current historiographical trend that recognizes the radical nature of antebellum black activists outside of slavery and within communities such as Boston and Cambridge. Yet in 1902, when he made this speech, the notion that militant black people could be repurposed and serve 20th century demands for radical civil rights was anathema to the era's racial conservatism. Indeed, public black radical protest was so distasteful in 1902 that the Boston Globe accused Trotter of straining things when he connected Massachusetts responsibility to Rogers to the state's antebellum personal liberty laws. The Attorney General was also dismissive in comparisons to the Black radical class. He ruled that Massachusetts had no legal basis for detaining Rogers. Booker T. Washington, president of Alabama's Tuskegee Institute and the most powerful Black man in the country, confirmed white insistence that Rogers should return to North Carolina for judgment. The school principal personally contacted North Carolina's governor, who advised him against, quote, giving in to, quote, the unreasonable demands of colored people in Boston and Cambridge. In response, Rogers' attorneys, much like the radicals of old, filed a writ of habeas corpus, arguing that North Carolina improperly indicted Rogers after he fled the state. People who assisted Rogers and Trotter in their case included William H. Lewis, the first black attorney general in the United States who lived in Cambridge and served on the Cambridge City Council, as well as Clement Morgan, a leader and a co-founder of the NAACP, and again, a member of the Cambridge Board of Aldermen in the late 1890s. Despite this expertise, however, and unfortunately for Rogers, conservative racial accommodation triumphed over radical black demands for his protection. On August 30th, as the attorney general reviewed the writ, Brockton police officers who were supposed to transport Rogers from Boston instead put him on a train back to North Carolina. There he stood trial for arson and attempted murder despite lacking an attorney. And even though the white man whose barn he supposedly burned failed to testify. Rogers was ordered to solitary confinement in the state penitentiary for a minimum of 15 years, but died of septic pneumonia four years later in 1906. Although Monroe Rogers was not saved, and despite Trotter and his supporters' temporary defeat, this protest, like countless 
Boston and Cambridge black-based protests that Trotter organized until his death in 1934. These protests galvanized black radical protests across the country and requires us to look at blackness in Boston and Cambridge through a different lens. So who was William Monroe Trotter? You can go to the next slide. Why was he alone among contemporaries in protesting unapologetically and radically against racial conservatism and white liberal apathy in the face of radical reconstruction's betrayal at the end of the last century? I put this picture up here, not just because it's of Trotter and his sister, but because the picture was actually taken at a black photography studio located on Adam Street in Cambridge in um, the 1870s. William Monroe Trotter was born in 1872, the year that liberal Republicans broke from their radical colleagues to oppose federal enforcement of the Reconstruction Amendments. He died exactly 62 years later as Democratic President Franklin D. Roosevelt presided over an administration that fundamentally changed the relationship between federal policy and the American economy. Book ended as he was between the failed promise of radical reconstruction and the racial limitations of New Deal liberalism, William Monroe Trotter's life represents the radical possibilities of Northern Black politics and Cambridge Black politics rooted in transnational Black radicalism. Trotter's life also reconceptualizes Black radicalism as a tradition that thrived and existed outside of the rural South, in the urban predominantly white Northeast, amongst an ethnically and culturally diverse Black community. Uh, next slide, please. There he is. Stories like this matter. They matter because they require us to reckon with our complex history by reimagining our political possibilities. They matter because they challenge us to rethink what we imagine about Boston, Cambridge, our neighborhoods, New England, and about blackness in a region that the of the country that for too long has reduced the long history of its African descended people to 17th and 18th century enslavement, to antebellum abolition, and 20th century busing. It has been my hope that Black Radical and the work that I do on public history sites, such as with BAC and with the Museum of African American History and the Trail Project, that this history helps to reinvigorate scholarship about Blackness, politics, and racial capitalism in New England by dissecting the lives of, and the communities of our most misunderstood citizens. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. All right. Um, I put this picture in and then I'll conclude. This is a picture of the Liberty League that Trotter led. It was the most radical uh, uh, organization of African Americans to meet um, during World War I. And this picture was actually taken in the yard of the uh, St. Paul AME Church in Cambridge. So it gives an idea of the centrality of the community. Um, and Trotter's in the front row. Um, and we can go over other members of the Cambridge Black community who are in the photo. On the importance of biography and community stories in our understanding of history, I will end with a quote by the wonderful historian Nell Irvin Painter, who states, quote, beyond even the most finely tuned categories lies something exceeding race, class, and gender, individual subjectivity. Uh, next slide. I remain convinced, she concludes, that historians should keep in sight the fundamental lessons of psychology and psychoanalysis. That all people, even people who describe themselves primarily as raced or gendered, are individuals. The individual subjects develop within families. That families need not be related biologically. That attachment does not necessarily connote positive feeling. That attachment and grief do not stop at social barriers of color or class. That families at every socioeconomic and economic level inculcate the finest and basis of values. Thank you, and I'll, I'll open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Carrie. That was um, so wonderful. And I'm, I will um, ask, I think, three questions uh, in the next 10, 15 minutes, and, and we'll engage in a, uh, that conversation before we open it up to uh, the larger group. And I think I'll, I'll ask my questions in terms of big, medium, and small, zoomed out to zoomed in. Um, and I, with the zoomed out question that I have, you know, you had you, the, so much deep information that you provided us uh, in the presentation. And one sentence was um, about the, the, the way that the story begins in some ways with the reconstruction in the 1870s. And it, this one ending of the story would be with the New Deal era uh, in the 1930s and the 1940s. And in the middle is the period that we often think of as the Jim Crow period, and we often associate Jim Crow with the South. 
So, um, however, the, the one of the anecdotes that you shared with us made it sound as though um, those uh, tentacles of Jim Crow were very much stretching up here to the north. So, can you can you uh, just kind of say a little bit more? This is my the big the big question about how much um, things that we think of as southern southern history, like Jim Crow are really also New England history? Or is there another way to, to maybe frame how Jim Crow situates and works with what happens here, for example, locally in Cambridge? Thank you for that question, and it's a good one. Um, I would say that there's, there's two things, and I think the point of my work, and I know your work as well, is to complicate what we think of as um, racism, what we think of as race, what we think of as racial policy. Because in particularly in the United States, we tend to think of race and racism as being um, um, the South with the white and colored signs or the self in terms of enslavement, right? And for a place like Cambridge, um, that's part of Massachusetts, in which slavery ended by the 1780s, and in which property holding black men could vote as early as 1783, and in which there was never a lynching like ones that occurred even in Maine New Hampshire or attempted lynching in New Hampshire um, and New York. Um, it can feel as though Cambridge, part of Massachusetts, is removed from the context of American culture and history. And in fact, one of the things we know by looking at someone like a Trotter, but also by his supporters and followers in Cambridge, there's um, a, a very famous minister in Cambridge during his time named Timothy Tice whose families were from, was from Jamaica um, and were involved in his, his activism. People like that would look at uh, Cambridge and Boston through the lens of um, a respite from the most um, um, horrible aspects of American racial violence and apartheid. So for instance, um, a very famous black man in Boston and Cambridge um, came out with a, a book in the 1920s in which he called Boston the Mecca of the Negro. He said, not because it is fashionable to say so, but because it is a place where the colored man at least is not molested by the tentacles of violence. That's why I liked your, your, your phrase, tentacles is kind of. <laughs> um, so, um, and what they meant by that was that yes, in Boston and particularly in Cambridge and in the area, um, there were no white and colored signs, right? Um, and black people could vote, which is one of the reasons why black people in the region had political power for an extended period of time until the state is redistricted in the 1940s. So Cambridge, for instance, had black members of the city council. Boston had members, delegates to the state legislature up until the 1900s and then up until the 1940s in terms of local government. So the reason of that was that black people could vote and they were organized and there wasn't sort of the, the biggest right. aspects of, of virulent segregation. What there was, however, is what we think of now um, and that still is just as devastating, right? Which is um, the uh, federal laws um, that were passed oftentimes with the support of lawmakers from Massachusetts or at least with the, um, um, uh, ignorance or benign neglect of, <laughs> of leaders from Massachusetts and New England, um, which basically nullified or weakened the 13th, 14th and 15th amendments at the end of the Civil War. And so what that meant was that even though black people lived in Cambridge or Boston, and even though the biggest period of black migration to both cities was from 1870s to the 1890s, then from roughly the 1940s to the 1950s, and then um, at least in Boston um, in the present era, era, right? So during those periods, people were coming for various reasons. One of them was that you did not well, have the virulent the racism that other areas of the countries had, but you still had, for instance, places that um, barber shops, uh, Trotter was involved in a, in a case in 1893 in which his Harvard classmate, William H. Lewis um, was, um, thrown out of a Cambridge barbershop because they said they did not do black hair. Um, and the black community then had to sue and change the laws in Massachusetts. And so I think that one of the things, and this is what I mean by the complexities of history, is that we have to look at history as not being what we think of as the traditional story of Southern racism, Southern lynching, Black people migrate to the North and it's good. We even have to reconceptualize what we think of as Black because when you're talking about um, 
Boston and Cambridge, the African descended people in those communities um, have always had people who were foreign born and had a very different way that they conceptualize race. Um, large Haitian migration community going back to the 1870s, people from the British speaking Caribbean, like my family, people from Cape Baird um, and South America. And so I think to answer your question, I know I'm going on for a while, is that the bigger picture is that no part of America is untouched by virulent uh, racism that is uh, permitted or sanctioned by law, right? All that happens is that certain areas of the country, fe country feel that differently than other areas of the country, right? But it doesn't mean that somehow, um, you know, you come to Cambridge and Boston and it's different. It's, it's um, your, um, not going to encounter racism, right? You just you encounter a different kind of racism, right? Trotter, by the time he died, and one of his moments of despair was that um, he his refrain was that the good people of New England are not listening, right? They don't understand that um, it doesn't really matter what's going on in your backyard, although it does, right? If you don't have a federal structure that is supporting the uh, laws that were passed during Reconstruction. Thank you so much. Um, and that's a really nice segue to my medium scale question, which is about, um, I guess it's about the Caribbean community. So one of the, there was one detail that I loved tracing through your book, which is um, Cambridge's and Boston's uh, Afro-Caribbean community in time. And there is the figure of uh, George Alexander McGuire mm -hmm. and uh, George Alexander McGuire plays an important role for St. Augustine's Church. And so if I ask the question in terms of freedom songs, in terms of a chorus of, uh, of activists and, and community leaders and thinkers and politicians who were coming together um, in this period and singing about freedom, how does the, how does Caribbean Cambridge leadership play into that? What's the role of the Caribbean factor, so to, so to speak, in the history of how um, the community is responding to exactly what you were just talking about? That's a great question. Um, one of the things I like to bring out my quotes as a, and the statistics as a historian. So we know that um, in every census since 1790, people who are defined as being black or of African descent in Boston and Cambridge in each of the censuses, at least 10% of those people who are defined by the census of black are foreign born. And at least 33% of them are children of foreign born. So that's one of the highest percentages and is the most consistently high percentages in the history of the country. And so what that means is that, um, and then I'm sort of building off of the research of people like Winston James, um, George Padmore, um, someone like a Richard B. Moore, who was a, a man from Barbados, who was the head of um, um, the Liberty League in Cambridge during the 1930s and 1940s. All of these people would say that then um, changes the political perception of the people within that community. It doesn't make it any better or any worse. It's not to say that you know somehow they're more enlightened, <laughs> but it is to say you're getting a different view. For instance, many people from the Caribbean, uh, particularly in uh, um, Alex George Alexander McGuire's church, the reason why they created the church was because many migrants from the Caribbean were, um, um, were not Baptist or AME church members, which is the predominant um, and the largest churches in Boston at the time. And many black people in Cambridge went over the bridge if they were AME or Baptist to attend churches um, in the late 19th century. If you were Caribbean, that wasn't your religion. What you were religion was um, similar to today is either Catholicism or Episcopalianism. And so that's why you have churches like um, um, St. Bartholomew's Church on King, uh, Columbia Road and Columbia Street. Um, you have uh, the creation of, of um, through St. Bartholomew's, the creation of the African Orthodox Church. And so that means that you have a very pan-African, um, we would say academically transnational Black consciousness, right? So when George Alexander McGuire founded the African Orthodox Church, he was responding to the fact that um, what we now think of as Cambridge Port, but you know, I grew up and it was called Central Square. Um, Central Square was a place where, you know, um, you had people who worked at the Neko factory. That's where my um, um, 
grandmother worked um, and many people from uh, Barbados and Jamaica from until the NECO factory closed um, were actively recruited by NECO from those islands and brought to have jobs in Cambridge port. So that all is to say that that Caribbean flavor, right? And that that has always been here. And one thing I will stress if any, nobody gets nothing more from my talk, which is that the conversation people have surrounding blackness in Cambridge now have always been happening. It's not new, right? <laughs> um, it's always been there. If you go back and look at sort of what people were saying, particularly black people at the time, you know, fears of gentrification, um, uh, cultural and ethnic diversity within the Black community, all of these things, right, um, have always been here. Um, and so what that means is that um, not just that we honor the history and that we help to preserve um, um, the African Orthodox Church and that we help um, educate people that that has a position within the broader Black diaspora that's beyond Cambridge and in, in Boston, right? Not just educate people that that's to be proud of in their community, but also that what does that then say about the possibilities of their community? If the conversations you're having about blackness and politics and gentrification and economics are not new, right? Part of that is very reassuring, right? You're not reinventing the wheel. Um, it might mean going back and looking at what has worked, what haven't, hasn't worked, but not approaching it as though we're living in some time that's never existed before. Um, um, and another thing about the Caribbean sort of diaspora is that we know that it means that when we're talking about blackness and black history, that's what we mean, right? And so this notion of trying to divorce Caribbeanness from blackness, African Americanness, in a place like Boston and Cambridge, it has no historical merit um, because they've always been intertwined, right? Um, the black people who are in Boston and Cambridge. Um, a good percentage of them, large minority of them, were in our Caribbean and had that consciousness. So I hope that answers your question. But absolutely, and there's another anecdote in your book that I I love about um, crowds uh, hankering to or rushing to um, the harbor to see the SS Douglas arrive, which is um, one of the um, shipping vessels of the Black Star Line that was founded by um, Marcus, Marcus Garvey, yeah. who was the leader of the UNIA. And of course, this UNIA, the United Negro uh, Improvement Association, um, had its center in Cambridge at St. Augustine's mm -hmm. African Orthodox Church in the early 1920s. And, you know, and so just thinking about how the project to, to free um, to live freely, to also free the mind, because I, I get that in the way that you write about William Monroe Trotter, that he was very interested in how to free the mind, not just to free, if you like, the body, how to think freely, um, and, and the importance of um, connecting abroad, connecting beyond the local, was all happening right here, you know, kind of in, our, in, in the Boston, in the Cambridge area, through the leadership of many of the figures that, that you focus on and, and the Afro-Caribbean leadership um, is especially important, um, which leads me to my, to my last question, which is the, the, the z zoomed in, the, the small scale question, which is about the importance of place. And I don't mean place in terms of Cambridge at large or even Cambridge Port, but I mean place in terms of local place, like an address, like 137 Alston Street, um, like St. Bartholomew's Church. Um, can you talk to us about how knowing our history, preserving our history, freeing our minds is related to the preservation of historical... ...like St. Augustine's African Orthodox Church, could serve could serve its purpose moving forward. Yeah, so very could, excellent could, question. Could, could serve to kind of keep something alive that needs to be kept alive. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think I, I just in terms of I mean I think where it, it, part of it is like preaching to the choir. So we're all here on a Tuesday night because we all like history and we like the neighborhood and we're passionate about where we live and all those types of things in Cambridge and preservation and history. Um, but even more than kind of a passion for that is a recognition that um, 
again, the place that you're standing on and the, the politics, the economics, the cultural issues you're having in the present have a long trajectory. And when you act out of that place, right, as when you act, however it is, in terms of legislation, in terms of policy, in terms of even kind of um, public school education, all of that, if you act from that place, that completely reorients the type of policy you come up with, right? So instead of arguing, um, for instance, in Boston and Cambridge over this whole idea of rent control, in, um, and this is just an example, right, in 2021, you know, what did Cambridge and Boston look like when there was rent control? And we actually have visions of that. So that's the history, right? You can actually go back and see what that actually looked like, right? And perhaps create a policy that takes into account that you've been here before, right? Um, issues of, of equity in public education, right? Again, which has long been an issue for uh, black parents um, and what we now refer to as, uh, as um, uh, multiracial parents in the city of Boston. That is not new, right? Um, and so how has that been dealt with um, in the past, right? Not so that you then repeat it, but that so that you're informed about where it is that you're where it is that you're coming from, right? My grandfather used to always say, you know, you can't, it is impossible to create any kind of political change if you don't acknowledge that you're part of a political trajectory. So if you're going into it thinking, I'm the first person who has ever had these issues in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2021, or I'm the only person who has ever conceptualized black politics and um, what that means and organ organizing um, in 2021. That's not true, right? And so once you start seeing that that's not true, it's not just um, recognition, it's more a form of empowerment, right? In that, um, and it actually makes for much more creative and long lasting and impactful policy, I would argue, because it's not just creating something in the moment, you're creating something that's grounded in, um, you know, um, historical precedent um, and in the neighborhood. It's also, I would say, a very powerful thing, just as a young person, to grow up knowing that the place you're in, regardless of how it looks in the present, that people who looked like you have always been there, right? And so for instance, when, and I talk about this with you, Chris, when, I, when our Tufts students come and they're coming from all over the country and the world and they come to Tufts and they're like, woe is me, I'm, I'm the only black or Latinx or Asian student who's ever felt this way at Tufts and I'm completely alone and abandoned, right? The thing that, um, students also often take comfort in is when they realize that there's this long history of people before them, right? It then makes your moment in at Tufts for the four years you're there, right, as an undergraduate, not seem as, oh my goodness, this is daunting and I'm completely um, adrift in terms of racial conversations. Um, so I, I would I would suggest, I, 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 I I'm a big believer in the importance of place, in the importance of preserving places so that people can see what these places look like. Um, and in acknowledging that what you see um, anywhere you walk over across Cambridge, Boston, anywhere really in Massachusetts is being you know, rebuilt in so many areas, there's something that was there before. And a lot of the time it was black people, native people or um, non-white people who were there first. Um, and so uh, that kind of gives the place a certain a certain amount of power. Thank you so much, and, and I love the way that you connected that question about place um, and thinking freely or freedom thinking to very concrete matters like policy um, and and mobilization around important policy decisions in our community right now, but also um, the theme of empowerment and also the the key term power um, and you know and 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 how important it is especially for historically uh, oppressed or systemically oppressed communities to know that there's a legacy of power um, that that supports them uh, so that that's thank you for 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 those insights I want to kind of now uh, pivot and make some time for Q and a um, you're welcome I probably will best see your hand if you use the reaction button to raise your hand, but you're welcome to, to do this. And I'm sh sure something will catch my eye. Um, <laughs> wonderful. No, but, but the reaction button works best. So Suzanne, please go ahead. 
Suzanne, you are muted still. Thank you. Um, you would think I would get a hang of this, right? Um, thank you so much for that. And uh, your mention of Marcus Garvey reminded me of the role of the American Colonization Society and indeed the engagement of uh, one of the vassals in that and wondering to what extent, if you know it, uh, the Cambridge area was in any way in the sort of forefront leadership um, um, sort of within the context of the promotion of the American Colonization Society. And or I know it was New England wide and East, Eastern Seaboard wide, but is there, do we have any evidence of that? Okay, so the American Colonization Society was created in 1817. It was created by slaveholders, um, Henry Clay, Francis Scott Key and others. Um, because of the idea that freedom for African-American people, as Clay said, was incompatible with the Anglo-Saxon Republic. Um, so when the American Colonization Society was created in 1817, uh, many white people who were anti-slavery, including people in New England and including the vassals. And in fact, you can go to the Mass Historical Society and um, the records of the Massachusetts branch of the, Africa, of the, of the ACS um, are in their archives. So you can actually see the names of people in there. So it was a popular organization. However, black people in Cambridge and Boston, almost immediately, as early as 1820, um, a uh, black family who were the um, called the Baldwins. Their daughter Maria Baldwin eventually became principal of what is now the Maria Baldwin School, formerly the Agassiz School. So her parents in the 1820s were two of the African Americans in Cambridge who organized against the American Colonization Society. And they joined forces with African Americans, specifically in Philadelphia and in Boston. Um, to basically argue that the American Colonization Society um, was um, the opposite of what they would suggest. So yes, the, the roots of white anti-slavery movements are in the ACS, but the roots of radical abolition are within the black community themselves. So the black community was the one beginning in the 1820s and it's in Cambridge, it's in Boston, it's in Philadelphia to say that the American Colonization Society was basically a society that was, as David Walker said, ridding the country of the true uh, sable arm of humanity that actually built it. So sort of uh, extraditing black people um, in, in favor of a white Republic. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Did Keisha have her 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 hand up? Um, go ahead, no. Paul. I, okay. I didn't know who that. I see Kenneth has his hand, but I and I see Nancy Woods as well. Shall we have? Shall yeah. we have Kenneth first? So, um, hi, Ken. Um, oh, Nancy, go ahead. Hi. Um, I have just finished listening to the first two seasons or two episodes, two seasons of a podcast called 1865, starting when, when Lincoln was assassinated through when Grant dies. And I was wondering if you all who are real historians could comment, have you listened to it? Um, it was pretty shocking how the freedmen were left kind of by themselves and um, kind of baked into the history that blacks should not be equal with whites in the South. But I turn it over to you all who are historians. Yeah, so so that's part of what my book is about. And I actually know um, one of the consultants on that um, is a, a good friend of mine, man named Kelly Carter Jackson. She's a professor at, um, at uh, Wellesley um, and then, um, um, yeah, so I know a couple of the people who are the historical consultants on mm -hmm. that program. So I, I haven't listened to that show. I will say, though, that, that you know, I'm, we tend to have in the United States this vision that slavery ends and somehow that was what abolitionists wanted. And particularly Black abolitionists wanted slavery to end, but they had a much larger and wider perspective on what they wanted that to look like. They wanted it to mean equal access to the vote. Black men, um, like Frederick Douglass, actually were the first group of men to say that that should go to women as well. Of course, there's a long history of why that didn't happen, but <laughs> it was another whole other conversation. Um, it, it, you know, but but you know, black people had a very radical way of what they wanted that to look like. 
the issue was, is kind of the issue that happened, I would argue, the similarly to what happened at the end of the civil rights movement. And my friend, um, um, who's a historian at Harvard and now is at Yale, uh, Elizabeth Hinton, great book, and she does a lot of work around this, which is that, you know, there's a backlash. And the backlash is this fundamental fear by many um, um, uh, white Americans of black um, politics mm -hmm. and um, black um, power, right? And so um, what happens during Reconstruction, and this is part of where the New England piece comes in, is that there are many Northerners, particularly in New England, and I go into this in the book, who were very, very happy that slavery ended, right? They were not very happy, however, when you started to get into issues of Black politics and Black people actually having districts that were all Black, that voted the way they wanted to, that might look different than, say, what a white person in Western Massachusetts would want, right? Um, they were very uncomfortable with the idea that um, African-American people, for instance, as early as 1864 were arguing for reparations, right? And actually went through um, systematically, right? So again, this is why things are not new and, and put, calculated how much black people were owed for their labor, right? Um, and so when you're talking about civil war and reconstruction, um, it's a moment to re remind us that it's not just a moment of betrayal um, of the freed people, but it's really a betrayal of, or a, a beginning of this notion that somehow freedom was given to black people. And somehow that meant that they, that freedom did not make them eligible um, for any kind of, of inclusion on an equal basis in the American body politic. Um, um, the other thing I would say is that, um, you know, American backlash of which I would argue we are kind of living through now, right? If you just look historically, that's what happens, right? So that's what I mean by looking historically, right? Same thing with after the American Revolution when places like Massachusetts and the North gradually ended slavery and black people could vote in the North, right? And states like New York and Pennsylvania by 1820 actually rewrite their constitutions to disenfranchise black people because they didn't like the fact that black, free black people could vote. Massachusetts is the only state that didn't. Um, so so I, I think that we need to look at, I know we like um, to kind of manipulate that quote by um, um, Wendell Phillips, right? Um, that, you know, the pro arc of uh, arc of justice meets or justice, or I'm, I'm saying it wrong, but the progress is, you know, pr progress is inevitable kind of idea. And we like to say that, but I, I you know, I would argue that Historically, that doesn't necessarily always happen unless there are radical people who are pushing for that to happen, right? Um, and that, as Timothy Snyder says out of Yale University, there's no guarantee that what we believe as being principles and kind of a baseline of decency are going to be there unless tomorrow, unless we're all saying that that's what we want to see. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ken, I'm coming over to you. OK, uh, I think I'm unmuted. Um, well, Ms. Greenwich, I, I've longed to meet you. So I'm, I'm was so pleased to hear your well, talk you. and so pleased to have to go out and get your book immediately. And uh, you know, Cambridge has its Greenwiches. So you're oh, part yes. of, of us <laughs> and, and your cousin Chip has told me all about you. So- Oh yes, Chip. I, <laughs> <laughs> now, and I must also thank you for that beautiful quote by Nell Irvin Painter, who was a graduate school at Harvard, yep. student at Harvard when I was an undergrad, and oh, so wow. is a, a, a dear person who I've known a lot of years. I'm about to have my 50th Harvard reunion. So, oh my goodness, you know, you know, you know my, you know my uncle then, David Dance. Yeah, of course. Yes. And, okay. So and that's his rather famous Cambridge mother. So yes. 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 No, my my grandmother. Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, uh, <laughs> yes. A, a, a very an early Cambridge black teacher. Uh, um, yes. Yep. Yes. So um, two things. There seem to be two strains where Cambridge kind of uh, is a leader, if you will. One is that many uh, blacks uh, in the 19th century moved to Cambridge because the schools were mm -hmm. integrated, which was distinct from Boston. So in Boston, they had built the Abiel Smith School on mm -hmm. Beacon Hill so that the black children had somewhere to go to school because they couldn't go to the white school. So that made Cambridge outstanding. And the second was that uh, now the in the Cambridge history, the name of 
Ms. Baldwin, we pronounce it as Mariah Baldwin. Mariah, yep. Okay, okay. And uh, she, in her role in American history, is that she was the first African-American to be the principal of a predominantly white school, mm -hmm. meaning a predominantly white faculty, yep. which uh, was so notable that in an a, a issue of Crisis Magazine, mm -hmm. which is the magazine of the NACP, which also has deep roots in Cambridge, yep. Boston, uh, the cover story was about Mariah Baldwin's appointment mm -hmm. and how, and this is a magazine that went out over the whole country because it was such an incredible uh, new thing as, as it were. And the last thing I would like to say to you, uh, this St. Paul AME Church and St. And, and St. Bartholomew's and St. Augustine's, mm -hmm. St. Augustine's is in Massachusetts now the last of these African Orthodox churches. Mm -hmm. So we really, that's, that's it, they're very important, but they also have had this connection with politics mm -hmm. and history. So it, those are wonderful institutions that we should uh, hopefully come to know more about in Cambridge. So uh, thank you. The, the only question in that is the, the Caribbean question. I am Jamaican on both sides. Mm -hmm. So I've always followed that uh, connection. There, there is this wonderful, not much gathered history of how all of these literal black carpetbaggers, meaning people from other places like me and yep. like uh, even Du Bois had Caribbean history because later on it was kind of determined that he has some Haitian strain, I believe. It's Caribbean, I think it's Haitian. Um, you know, we've gathered here, many of us coming out of Harvard and forgetting to go home. So I, I'm glad, I, I, I hope someone will gather that story because it, it's, I think, historically significant. Excellent. And thank you so much for that. And Kenneth Rees, my grandfather, I mean, my grandmother would talk about your last name. So <laughs> it's good to see you. Yes. So good to see you. But um, yeah, I mean, I mean, and, and I think that's the point. I think when you're looking at um, Black history in a place like Cambridge and Boston, um, you have to take into account of what, of what Blackness means to the people who live there. And that that will be a completely different way of looking at politics, of looking at economics of looking at gentrification, then might be, you might miss if you came in um, with a view. And again, that's not to say that there's something um, exceptional about that, right? Um, black people are a diasporic people. So, 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 you know, that's there, but, you know, particularly in Cambridge and Boston, um, when you have that history, um, it means that the way then you interpret that history might look slightly different than if you're in Mississippi, right? <laughs> and very different than if you're in Detroit. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it's important to embrace what that actually looks like instead of relying kind of on even the things that very well educated people think about the trajectory of blackness in the United States. Well, we have this interesting thing where most of the black people in Cambridge come from North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Barbados and Jamaica. And uh, Southern states people came because somebody from their city or town came here and then they followed them. But mm -hmm. we have a very specific catchment of folks who are black here from those places. And Haitian, I mean, one of the things we're discovering now is Haitian. So we tend to think of Haitian migration as being recent, it's not. Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. first wave of Haitian migration to Cambridge was in the 18, big migration, so about 50 families was in the 1820s, right? Mm -hmm. That's where um, Mariah Baldwin's family came from, right? Mm -hmm. The next big migration is the 1880s, right? Um, so even when we're talking about sort of the reports we're hearing from the border in 2021 and, and the Haitian American community in greater Boston, that has a much longer trajectory than people kind of give it credit for when they're talking sort of in terms of political terms today. Thank you. Learning a lot. Thank yes. you. Kathy has her hand up. Thank you, Paula. Go ahead, Kathy. Unmute. I'm looking at the chat and there are people interested in the photograph you showed, Carrie, of Trotter in the yard at St. Paul AME. And I think people would like to hear more about St. Paul. 
AME. And then I just want to make sure uh, we'll, we have, we'll, we'll close at 7.15, but I want to make sure, Chris, that you get to talk a little bit about your work on um, repatriation in Black Ghost of Empire. And I want to make sure Carrie gets to speak a little bit about her history trail work, which is, you know, both projects are very important. Yeah. Sure, thank you, Kathy. I wonder whether Laura has that slide that she could put up, and um, maybe Carrie, you could, uh, you could, we could take you up on on your invitation to tell us more about who's in the picture. Yes. So, um, Trotter is in the center, um, with the mustache. Um, <laughs> in the second row, the first person in the second row with the hat, that's his wife, Geraldine Louise Trotter. Next to her is um, his mother, Virginia Isaacs Trotter. The ones I know who are from Cambridge specifically um, is the woman behind Mrs. Trotter. Yeah, um, yes, right there. Um, is a woman named, um, um, hold on, I have it in my notes. Um, Henrietta McLean. And the McLeans were um, a, a Cambridge family um, beginning in the 1880s um, that were associated with, um, let me see which church, something called the Afro-American Group of the Episcopal Church, which he founded in 1922. That's his daughter, um, Henrietta McLean. Um, and then the um, man, so if you go in the first row, the man in the far and the right with the hat on his knee um, that is Cornelius Spencer, um, who founded something called the Young Colored Men's Democracy League of Cambridge um, in uh, 1913. Um, and who else? Oh, and then the... Um, the man in the back row, um, second from the right, is uh, um, Cyrus Moore, who was a cousin of Richard B. Moore. And Richard B. Moore was a black militant from Barbados um, who ended up being ahead of the, both the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and then the, um, um, the Marxist group, oh my God, I'm having a brain fart, uh, Chris or somebody would know, that's uh, uh, the Liberator magazine with Max Eastman. So they were kind of surrounding Max Eastman and there was a, a communist oh. connection, con uh, um, contingent and that's his brother behind there. So, um, you know, it, it's one of those things where the more you look into the history of these communities and you focus on, as Nell per Painter would say, the people in communities, you start to find all these connections um, and biographies of people in a lot of these images, right? Um, this picture is a property of Columbia University. Otherwise, I would send it to people, but what I can do is make a copy, find a copy from my editor at Norton, who has like the rights to it, and then send it to the historical societies with the names on the back. Um, I just can't send this clip because it's technically from Columbia, but I can send, if somebody gives me sort of the contact information at the end of it, I can send the link and the, um, the names on the back. Thank you so much. Yes, that's fantastic. And we got a, another question that was sent to me directly, um, basically asking if, if we can spend a little more time in the historian's workshop. We have a number of professional historians in the group, local historians, community historians, um, historians. And uh, the historians are wondering, well, the historians are first of all dazzled by your sources and are wondering, can you tell us more about how you found all of this material? Uh, for example, um, Miss Baldwin's parents, you know, that, that you, you were able to locate her parents. How, does, how did you do all of this? It's, it's stunning. Um, <laughs> primary sources. So one of the things I will point out, like I tell my students is don't rely on stuff for black history on a secondary source online, because like 81% of it is probably wrong. Um, and, and that's not just hyperbolic. Um, there's a student named Jarvis Gibbons, who's at Harvard University. He just, he just became a professor there. 
and he did part of his graduate work on detecting the lies that are online in terms of just basic knowledge of Black history and the websites he like surveyed like I think a thousand websites and it's like 81 percent of those had demonstrably false information. So I will I will say um, and you know that might be a reflection of the internet, but it's also just kind of where people are at in terms of their assumptions. So everything is primary sources. So for instance, for Mariah Baldwin, when I worked at the um, Black Heritage Chair with Chandra Harrington, I hope she's still here. Shout out to her way back in the day. You know, um, we always heard that Mariah Baldwin lived in Cambridge and her parents were migrants, right? Well, you can go right into Ancestry and see what that looks like. And then you can also look um, when you find her record on who her neighbors were. Right. And oftentimes you're not just looking for the one person, you're looking for what did their neighborhood look like. Right. And so if you go into, for instance, where Mariah Baldwin work and you just go through the pages next to her name, you find there's all these people born in the British West, in the French West Indies or the British West Indies. Right. That means there's a community of West Indian people there, even if you're not going to get that from a book that you get about. Mariah Baldwin or a little excerpt, right? So everything is primary sources. Everything is looking at, I mean, one of the things that I, I studied in graduate school was black newspapers, right? Black newspapers and not the ones that we are the more famous ones, right? So every black community beginning in the 1870s from you know Nevada to Maine had their own black newspaper, right? They might've only lasted for a year. They might have. Um, they might not have been very, uh, to be able to compete with say the crisis, but they were there. And what those are valuable for is that that's a record of the community. That's people writing in and saying, oh, my sister is coming from, um, from Trinidad and she's gonna stay with me on Alston Street and she's gonna work at so-and-so's house and can somebody pick her up from the trolley, right? And there's, there's detailed stuff like that in newspapers. So um, that's sort of a, a, a way to do it. And um, then just reading people's accounts of the place where they lived. So the, we're lucky enough, we live in Massachusetts where um, Massachusetts and New England's are very talkative bunch. And we like to talk about ourselves. <laughs> and so uh, that can be very um, time consuming if you're listening, <laughs> but it also is good in the sense that there are sources more than you would think of black people talking about being black, say in Cambridge and Boston. If you go to the Mass Historical Society, it's not going to be in a file that says black voices of Boston, right? It might be, say, in the Henry Cabot Lodge papers, right? Because Henry Cabot Lodge had a relationship with the Black community in, in Boston. It might be in the John Andrew papers. He was governor and he was an abolitionist governor and he wrote to all of these Black people. It might be in Sumner, the Sumner papers, right? So it's a matter of digging, finding out who Black people were talking to and kind of getting creative with how you look at sources. But I would say, don't trust like just doing a Google search, particularly for Black history. Um, you're not gonna find um, it's what you're looking for unless you're looking for primary sources from the material um, and kind of really dissecting. Another thing I would say for historians is that um, complicating what we think of as Blackness, and I know that sounds um, kind of you know academic, but what that means is that we know that the way census takers recorded race changed every single census year. So in 1850 was the first year they had a category for mulatto. And all that meant was that if the census taker could discern that the person was of mixed African race. And so for a place like Boston and Cambridge, that becomes difficult because <laughs> it's just whatever the, the census taker who was white thought when they opened the door of a house. And so you'll find if you go into these neighborhoods, like one house might say it's a neighborhood of white people. And yet I'm doing research on Trotter and I know that William Monroe Trotter is black, right? And he says in the note, Negro with a question mark, right? And so it's really a matter of knowing how to read the sources, particularly not taking for granted what sources say about race. Because again, if race is a construct and it is just looking at the census, that means that um, particularly in Cambridge, um, the McLean family, for instance, half of them are listed as white in the 1920s. We know that that's not true because then the McLeans went to uh, the Cambridge um, uh, post office and demanded that their background be changed to Negro because they were proud of being black and they saw the they, they saw sort of the statistics of the neighborhood and they're like, why is half of our family cut out? And there's lots and lots of cases like that, particularly all, all over the country, but particularly in a place like Boston and Cambridge where the black community is smaller, right? You have white census takers who it's like the first time they've ever been in contact in a black person's home, they open the door and it's literally their directions are just to say what they see. And if you're just going by phenotype, 
We know this, right? You're not going to capture, you know, what's going on with the people in there, right? So, so that's one one thing I would say to historians, right? And my students, my my colleague, Ken, Chris is my colleague at Tufts named Kendra Field, who's a brilliant historian. She teaches a course called, she and I teach a course together called Black and Native New England. And one of the exercises we have students do is choose a street in, in New England and just look at how that street is described, the residents are described in each census, right? And what does that mean for the face of the neighborhood? But also if you see like the same person there over a 20 year period and one year they're listed as white and the next as mulatto and the next they're listed as uh, a question mark, which was an option in Massachusetts, it might tell you what's going on in terms of race and, and identity and, and communi communities. Thank you so much, uh, Carrie. It's, you know, so wonderful to, to also observe the way that you teach um, in addition to the way that you research. Um, and the way that you communicate this, this rich history, um, it has been a true pleasure uh, to be in conversation with you and also with, um, with you all. Uh, I see that we've reached the, the appointed hour. So um, I think folks probably wanna get to dinner at some point. Um, so I think it's time to wrap. I'm gonna turn it over to Paula and to Kathy to, to wrap things up. But before I do, uh, I want to share the two links in the chat. The first is, um, it's the link to Black History in Action for Cambridgeport, of which both Carrie and I um, are, you know, are, 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 are not only members, but are really helping to, to kind of keep it, keep it going in the right direction. Um, I wanted to let you know that Black History in Action back um, is organizing a set of community consultations because our, our hope is that this physical space, 137 Alston Street, becomes one of many locations in which we can elevate precisely the kind of history and teaching and, and public history and outreach that um, that Carrie Greenwich has has just provided for us, but to provide it for the community and other uses of the space. We'd love to have you help us think through what those uses could be. If you are in a place to help us imagine together, please do contact us. I'm putting in, that's my second link here, um, the link to contact us at, at back. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to work with you. Um, we'd love to sing together using the metaphor that I started with. Um, let, me, let me turn it over to Paula and uh, Kathy. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Well, thank you. This has been delightful. Yes, a round of applause. I'm really going to turn it over to, to Kathy to close us out, but I do want to just buy this book <laughs> or read this book, borrow this book, but um, it really is it really is a treasure. And um, I think when it first came out, this was the last in-person event at the Athenaeum. It was freezing cold, but it was the last in-person event before the pandemic hit. So, uh, <laughs> well, thanks for coming out. It's wonderful. Thank you. I, I want to thank you all. Um, Carrie and Chris and Paula for your contributions to this program. It was amazing. And uh, you can read that in the chat. Um, kudos, kudos, kudos. Um, 